Hey, my name is Milan, I am a software architect and Microsoft MVP, and in today's video we're going to talk about API versioning in .NET and how you can combine it with feature flags to gradually roll out new API versions to your users. So let's say we have a simple .NET 9 web API with a products controller. We're also using EF core in memory to simulate some data, and inside of the controller I have two endpoints. The first endpoint just returns a list of all products, and the second endpoint returns the details for one product. And the specific response type that we are returning is called product response version 1. It only contains an ID, name, and price. However, let's say we want to introduce a version 2 response that is more detailed. It contains the product information and inventory information as separate objects, and these objects could be more complex on their own. So how would the response look like when we return it to the user? So I'll jump into a quick presentation to demonstrate what I mean. This is the version 1 response that only contains the identifier, the name, and the price of the product. Now let's say we want to introduce a version 2 response that contains more details which are needed because our product is evolving. And let's say it contains some pricing and inventory information, all of which we have available in the database already, we are just not exposing it through the API. So the new response object contains some additional nested types inside, we move the actual name of the product into a nested product field, and we move the pricing information into a new object also nested inside of the product object, and we added a new object called inventory. So if we just update our API from the version 1, like we have here, to version 2, we are going to break any existing consumers because the name and pricing info are no longer in the same spot in the response. So how we are going to solve this is by introducing API versioning. So let me first guide you through adding API versioning to a .NET project. We're going to need to install a few NuGet packages and the ones that you want to look for start with ASP versioning. So let me look for that. And now there are a couple of them that you can choose from, depending on what type of API you're building. For minimal APIs, you want to use ASP versioning HTTP. For controller-based APIs, you want to use ASP versioning MVC. So let's go ahead and install that. And I'm also going to install the MVC API Explorer package. And now we are ready to introduce API versioning. It all comes down to introducing a couple of services into the dependency injection container. And the first method I'm going to call is add API versioning. Of course, I'm going to set up the API versioning options and then let's see what we can configure here. So I'm going to set the default API version to a new API version instance. And let's say that the default version is currently version one. Then I'm going to say that we want to assume that the default version is present if it's not specified. So any request that doesn't contain an explicit API version is going to use the default one. Let's also report the API versions in the response. And then I'm going to set the API version reader property where you can combine multiple strategies for API versioning. Now I'm going to use the simplest one and the one that's probably most widely used. And this is URL based versioning where we have the API version hard coded into the request route. So now let's chain a few more calls and one of them is going to be add MVC. This is also something that's needed for controllers. And now I'm going to add API Explorer. And this step is more or less optional. It's mainly used if you also want to make this work with Swagger. So I'm going to just set a few properties that are going to play nicely with Swagger because I'm using it in this project even though it's not available out of the box with a .NET 9 API. So this is my API versioning setup. Now the next part is actually using it inside of a controller. So the first thing we have to do is to define which API version this controller accepts. So I can say that this controller accepts version 1 because this is all I have right now, but this also allows me to define a second API version, let's call it version 2. So now how do I use this to define multiple API versions? For here is the version 1 endpoint and we have to map it to the specific API version we want to use. So let's say this maps to version 1 and then I'm going to just introduce the implementation of the version 2 endpoint. I named it get product v2, it has the same route parameters, except I'm mapping it explicitly to the version 2 of our API. 
the logic inside is a bit different. Instead of returning the version one response, we are returning the version two response. And you can see that the query is just a bit more complex in the projection. Now, everything else is pretty much identical. What's another thing that we are missing? So how are we going to specify the API version in the route? If I just hard code version one, then all of our endpoints are going to resolve to version one. If I hard code version two, then we have a similar problem. Of course, there is a smarter way to approach this where we can specify the API version as a route parameter and I can even introduce the API version route constraint. So now that we have API versioning implemented, let's actually test it out. I'm going to use an HTTP file where I can send a request to my API to fetch all of the products and then based on the product ID, I'm going to send another request to fetch a version one response and this is what we get back. You can see it contains just the ID name and price but if I send a request to the version two endpoint, we're going to get back a much more detailed response. And obviously there are some breaking changes with the version two API, which is why we decided to version this API endpoint. So now what is our next step? Now I want to introduce feature flagging or feature management to gradually roll out the version two response to a bigger pool of users. So let me show you how we are going to introduce feature flagging. So we have to install an additional NuGet package and let's look for feature management. The base library is Microsoft Feature Management, but there's also the Microsoft Feature Management ASP.NET Core NuGet that contains some integrations with ASP.NET Core controllers. So I'm going to install both of these libraries and then let me show you how to configure them. I can close this down. So all I need to do to introduce feature management is just say builder services add feature management. That's all there is to it. So now the next thing we want to do is to actually be able to configure our feature flags and we can do that through the application settings. So I have to introduce the feature management section. This is the default one. You can give it a custom name and then you will need to provide that section to the add feature management method call. But let's go back to our feature flags. Let's say I want to have an on off switch if I want to be using the version one API or the version two API. So for example, if I only want to enable the version one API, I'm going to create a feature flag called use v1 product API and then a respective use v2 product API and I'm going to turn the first one on by specifying true and turn off the second one by specifying false. So now how do I use these feature flags? Well inside of my controller I can go ahead and inject an i feature manager service. Let's go ahead and add that through the controller and now I can use the feature manager to check the state of my feature flag before executing the endpoint. So for example, if I say await feature manager is enabled async and I specify the feature name, which is use version one product API, then I can know if this feature is enabled or not. And let's say if it's not enabled, I'm just going to return not found. I can do the same in my second endpoint, except here I'm going to be checking the version two product API. Now, of course, you don't want to be hard coding your feature flags inside of your code. This is going to make it harder to maintain. So what I suggest you do is to create a file or class to be more precise, that's going to contain your feature flags. So let's call this the feature flags type. I'll make it, for example, internal and static. And all I want to have here is a set of constants. This is going to be a string constant and I'm going to give it the same name as the feature flag value. So let's define the other feature, internal const string. This is also going to be an internal constant string value and the feature flag name is use version two API. Now, another option that you could consider is using enums. I find strings more flexible and easier to work with. So that's the approach I'm taking. So now I can specify my feature flag name using my static type and I'm going to specify the version one API here. And here I will say feature flags version two API. So now we have something to work from. Let's go ahead and test this out. I'll go back to my HTTP file and I'm going to send a request to the version one endpoint. And you can see that it's returning a response. Now the version two endpoint is returning not found. And this is because my feature isn't enabled. Now, if I go to the app settings, 
and update this to true, it's going to pick up the change that I made. And now when I send the request, it's going to turn on the feature. So this is how feature flagging works. It gives you a simple on off switch that you can control from your application settings. Of course, you can connect this to Azure app configuration so that you can change these values at runtime without having to redeploy your API. However, the baseline approach to using feature flags is extremely limited. You can do all that much with just some simple on off switches. You need to be able to somehow target a specific user or specific groups of users so that you can actually configure which pool of users have access to a new feature. This allows you to gradually roll out a new feature and test it out and catch any errors that you can fix before rolling out the new API version to all of your users. So let's say that we want to target a more specific group of users for the version 2 product API. You can use what's called a feature filter and these come out of the box with feature management and the one that I want to use is called Microsoft Targeting. There's also a percentage-based filter where you can randomly target a percentage of all users for a given feature flag, but this is too random to be actually practical. There's also a time-based feature filter where you can enable a feature for a given period of time, and this might be useful for some short-time promotions or when you want to enable a specific feature for a small time window, but the most useful one is the targeting filter. So let me show you how to use it. Instead of using true or false, for the feature flag definition in my application settings, I'm going to provide an object. And this object is going to contain an enabled for property. And here, I'm going to specify an array of feature filters. Now, the only filter that I will use is the Microsoft targeting filter. So this is how I'm going to specify it. And then I can provide a set of parameters to target my audience. And here, I can target either individual users based on their identifiers. Now, how we provide these values, I'm going to show you in just a moment but let's just assume that user 1 and user 2 are actually user IDs. Now I can also provide user groups and this gives me a bit more freedom because I can target a wider group of users that belong to some group. For example, you could target users that are in a specific role. So let's say I have some beta testers and internal users and I want to give them access to my version 2 API endpoint. Now the default rollout percentage for anyone who doesn't match my audience is going to be zero. So nobody outside of this audience is going to see see this new feature. Now this also allows you to exclude a user or a group of users by specifying the groups array. So you can see how this can be pretty flexible. Now, how do we actually use this? The targeting feature filter uses something called a targeting context. And you can provide a custom implementation for a targeting context. So I'm going to add a new type called user targeting context. So let's make this internal and sealed and I will need to implement the iTargetingContext accessor interface. Now this only contains one method that actually returns the targeting context. However, I will need to implement a few more things to actually be able to use this. So I'm going to need an HTTP context accessor because I'm going to execute this on each request and then I'm going to drop two helper methods that I'm going to use to create a targeting context. The first one is called getUserID and I'm going to use my HTTP context to access the request headers and I'm going to look for an XUserID header and use that as my user ID. The second helper method that I have is called getUserGroups. It's going to return an array of strings and here I'm just going to look in the user groups header and split that into an array of strings. Now of course I added some comments and in a real world scenario, you will be pulling these values based on the claims of the currently authenticated user. In the get user ID, obviously you want to return the subject claim or whatever claim you're using to represent the user ID. And then for the user groups, you have a lot of flexibility. You could be using roles or you could have a custom implementation for assigning the users to a group. So let me save the HTTP context into a variable and I'm going to access it from the HTTP context accessor. Then I'm going to create a new instance of my targeting context. So let's create a targeting context. And this basically contains two properties. One is a user ID. So let's go ahead and assign that as the result of our method call. And the second is an enumerable of strings representing the groups. So let's call get user groups, pass in the HTTP context. And now I can return this as the result of this method. So I'm going to create a new value task and pass in the targeting context. One more optimization that you can do here is to introduce caching on the HTTP request level because this may get called multiple times. So when you have the HTTP context, 
you can check if the items dictionary contains a specific key. I'm going to say try get value and I already defined my cache key and let's say that the result is a targeting context that was already created. So in that case I'm going to return another value task except I will have to cast my object value into a targeting context. So this is just a small optimization to improve performance and this will help if you are doing some database requests in the helper methods that I defined here. Now let's go back to the controller and here I want to get rid of the feature manager because there's a simpler way to use feature flags if all you need is just an on off switch. You can use the feature gate attribute that also accepts a feature flag name and is going to achieve the same result that we already had with the feature manager. So now I'm using feature gates and these are controller specific but they still allow me to use my feature flags on my API endpoints. So with the feature gates in place our user targeting context implemented to create a targeting context with a user ID and a set of groups and we also configure the specific rule for when the version 2 product API should be enabled. How do we actually use this? Well all it takes is a simple method call after calling add feature management and we're going to say with targeting and here I can specify my user targeting context. So now the feature management service is going to use my custom targeting context to access the current user's ID and the available groups. So let's go ahead and test this out. I'll go to my HTTP file and if I send a request to fetch all of the products I get back a response. If I send a request to the version 1 endpoint I will also get back a response and if I send a request to the version 2 endpoint I'm getting back a response only because I specified the correct user ID and user groups headers. Now as I said in a real world scenario this is going to come from your claims either in a cookie or access token but for the purpose of this demo I'm going to specify the user ID myself. Now what if I use the user 0 and send a request? You will see that I'm getting back a 404 not found and the reason is because because I excluded user 0 from this feature flag. Exclusions take precedence over the allowed audiences so this is how you can exclude a specific group of users. Now when it comes to targeting I can either specify the specific user so let's say user 1 or user 2 will both have access to this endpoint but user 0 will not whether or not I specify the user groups doesn't matter. Now if I just specify the user groups and these are one of the valid groups then I will have access. If I have a mixed bag one group has access and one doesn't then the feature flag will still be enabled but if I have a user group that's not configured then we're also going to get back a 404 not found. And you can manage all of this through something like Azure app configuration where you can update these values and runtime to gradually roll out your feature to a wider pool of users that you have available in your system. So what we covered here is a pretty advanced use case for working with feature flags in .NET. If what you are looking for is a simple introduction to working with feature flags then I recommend that you check out this video next. Thanks a lot for watching, check out my courses to improve your software architecture skills and until next time stay awesome.